Welcome to episode nine of the G2 on 5G, the latest scoop on everything related to 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend and joining me again this week is fellow analyst, Angel Sag. So let's get started with my first topic. Um, this week it was reported that Nokia's new CEO, Pekka Lundman, I believe, uh, will be starting one month early. And uh, no surprise, apparently, he wrapped up his duties at his, you know, with his prior commitments. And, and so Rajiv Suri will, uh, will be leaving um, as well. Rajiv will, will remain on the board. Um, you know, I, I think Becca's going to have um, a lot to wrap his, uh, his hands around. You know, from my perspective, um, bright spots for Nokia continue to be their private networking uh, business unit, uh, Nokia Enterprise. They continue to rack up wins. This week, they made an announcement. Um, I believe it was with Toyota, and um, so you know, I believe that he's going to want to lean heavily into that and focus on that. Catherine Buvak, you know, who was leading that unit recently, left, and they have a new person in charge. But um, but I think that would be you know um, you know high priority. And then you know recently, there's been a lot of uh, you know discussion around Nokia's focus on cloud RAN and open RAN. And, um, you know, that can be challenging. It can be a double-edged sword. I mean, it's going to bring agility. You know, it's going to bring, um, you know, CapEx savings to, to operators. But it could also potentially eat into um, their traditional radio access network equipment. What, what are your thoughts about all that, Angel? Well, I think, I think it's important that they do have a new CEO as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I, think, I think one of Nokia's biggest problems is, They've been having a lot of changes of the guard um, Mm -hmm. in the executive suite, not just the CEO. Um, And I think that's been an issue for the company because, you know, it's hard to know where the company's going when when the leadership keeps changing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think they need to decide on who they want to run the company and stick with it. Um, And I think it's going to be really important for them to push uh, open, ran hard and, Mm -hmm. you know, really get momentum on that because, um, you know, there's a lot of pushback on it from the incumbents. Yeah. And um, for obvious think, reasons. Yeah. And I think I think the the big thing is going to be, you know, who's going to be the operator that tips the balance mm-hmm. in a way that helps Nokia. Um, because I think if you look at the market today, you know, Open RAN is still kind of a, an experiment mm-hmm. when it comes to you know production environments. Yeah, it's been in trials, um, yeah. Right, so I, I think that um, there's a lot of promise uh, and there needs to be more execution. And really, I think what they need is a, you know, a big operator to adopt it and mm-hmm. to embrace it. But I think the reality is, is that a lot of the, you know, legacy infrastructure guys are gonna do everything within their power to keep, uh, you know, the, th- the maintain the status quo Mm-hmm. and keep their customers happy and encourage them to stick with them. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly a potential differentiator for Nokia. I mean, there, there's no question they're, they're trailing, you know, um, Ericsson and, and Samsung and even Huawei. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But let's, uh, let's shift topics. Let's talk about your first topic this week. And um, you did a little bit of research and uncovered a report by the GSA related to millimeter wave spectrum. So why don't you take us through that? Yeah, so the GSA does, they do reports. Um, they've been doing reports for a long time, mostly on like uh, device and technology penetration. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just did a report for June where they found that 97 operators in 17 different countries hold millimeter wave spectrum uh, for 5G. And the majority of that is within the 24 to 29, 29 gigahertz mm-hmm. bands, with most of it being in 28. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is, is that while millimeter wave does not solve a lot of problems and has a lot of problems on its own, mm-hmm. um, I think that a lot of people have decided to hammer at millimeter wave and its, and its weaknesses today, mm-hmm. rather than consider what its prowess and potential could be in the future when mm-hmm. implemented and deployed correctly right. with, you know, the right backhaul and, um, you know, the right types of devices utilizing it. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's harder to see that in the in today's COVID environment when everyone's mm-hmm. isolated. But the reality is, you know, 
this will end eventually and people will start to, you know, recongregate in dense, you know, capacities. And as a result, millimeter wave is going to be absolutely necessary to be able to serve, you know, thousands of people at the same time, because the reality is today, 4G just does not cut it in, in a dense environment. Once you mm -hmm. have over a couple hundred people on the same cell site, it's done. So, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, even if you start splitting them out, you need, you need millimeter wave, you need to get people on and off quickly. You have to add capacity, mm -hmm. um, and you know, 97 operators, um, I don't think 97 operators would invest in Spectrum unless they really believed that there was a long-term future for it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you touch on backhaul, and um, as many people know, um, with millimeter wave, you you got to build density, right? And that's yeah. that's an expensive proposition. And you know, you're seeing the U.S. you know from a global perspective lead and focusing on millimeter wave when you look at. Uh, T-Mobile and, and AT&T is an example, but but it's quite costly. And, and I agree with you. Uh, having nearly 100 operators globally that own those spectrum assets mean that they're going to eventually do something with them. But you know, I, I think when you look in Europe and you look in you know in China, um, they're focused on deploying in the low and mid band to get you know that that wider coverage area for obvious reasons. Yeah, cover those and dense populations. The one thing I'll add is, um, I think if you look at where population centers are at and where the majority of these companies customers are located um millimeter wave is how you serve the majority of your customers in mm -hmm. dense urban environments the sure. suburban environment is where you're going to you know use mid band and low band and right. rural is going to be mostly mid band and low band as well right. but you know in the, in the in the city centers you need millimeter wave and i, I think everybody realizes that yeah, no, it's going to be critical. Well, let's shift to my second topic this week. And uh, HPE held its signature Discover event. It was virtual, like many other events have been virtual, um, given COVID-19. Um, there were some announcements around their IT consumption um, services, Point Next and GreenLake. But what I focus on is obviously Telco and 5G. And um, they announced something they call their, uh, their Edge Orchestrator. And the whole idea is, you know, HPE and Aruba are, are trying to bring the cloud and the network edge together um, to, you know, create, you know, transformation um, for organizations and support use cases like autonomous driving. And the, obviously the whole benefit of, uh, of edge uh, compute and putting resources at the very, you know, kind of outline edge of the network is to uh, reduce latency and be able to where data is created, be able to, to analyze that and, and have insights into that and then be able to act on it. So there, this announcement was around um, offering operators basically um, uh, an, an application store where you know, cust their customers can very, you know, with, they say with one click ease, deploy edge applications quite easily. And this complements um, some other announcements that were made um, earlier in the year in the spring around um, a new platform, ODIM, that's designed to kind of ease operator deployment and, and be able to harmonize um, and manage, you know, existing networks with, with new networks, you know, as 5G, you know, sort of comes on um, online there. So um, I think it's compelling, you know, I believe operators, you know, they're dipping their toes into virtualization. We saw some announcements this week, for example, from uh, Verizon, uh, there was an announcement at Cisco Live last week around um, an announcement with Verizon as well. Um, but um, I, I really believe these operators, they need a trusted advisor and they need some guides on how they can offer these edge services to their customers. So do you have any, any insight or input into that as well? Yeah, I, my, my insight is a little bit less specific to HPE, but kind of more around the entire industry mm -hmm. in that I think the operators may have missed an opportunity to leverage their advantage on 5G needing edge compute um, mm -hmm. and more cloud compute. Um, because it seems like um, if you look at what edge compute exists today, a lot of it is CSP powered. Mm -hmm. And I worry for the operators in the sense that, that it may be a lost opportunity for them Mm -hmm. um, because I think that the CSPs are much more likely to be the ones who fund the hardware expenditures. And let's be honest, are most likely going to be the ones running the code and software anyways. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I, I think you know there was an opportunity for the operators to you know work with vendors like HPE to yeah. get edge compute on their network and and charge it for it as a service right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they might still be able to do that but I think they made it much it's much more difficult today when you see what Amazon and Microsoft are offering yeah yeah, um, yeah. and I think that's something to consider a lot of people you know may have forgotten but uh, I don't think it's going away. I don't believe so either. And you know, you mentioned you mentioned AWS. So you know, th there was an announcement this week on um, um, a device called Snowcone. It got me really, you know, thinking about summer when I was a kid and <laughs> <laughs> and enjoying shaved ice. But but it's designed to you know to be um, an edge an edge appliance that um, can actually work offline and will operate on very, very low power. It's an extremely small form factor. It's easily deployable. And so the web scalers are jumping into this as well. I mean, there've been lots of announcements from, from AWS, uh, you know, Azure as well, beefing up their, right. their, their telco capabilities. Google's a little bit behind, you know, in, from my perspective, but, totally. but I I HPE, sees, HPE sees the opportunity. And quite frankly, I think Aruba's done a hell of a job with um, building out this intelligent edge um, vision and, and deployment scenario and is really allowing you know, Aruba Division, a company that they acquired five years ago, to really uh, lead that, that strategy. So I, it's an opportunity. I mean, HPE sees the opportunity and I think they're, they're very well positioned. So well, let's shift to, uh, to your second topic this week and it's around um, claims from another China, uh, Chinese operator. Yeah, so um, China Mobile, um, which is, I believe the biggest operator in China, so one of the biggest. Yeah, I think it's the biggest. Um, they claim that they've got 55.6 million 5G subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a big number, 55 yeah. million, quite a bit. Um, I think if you think about it, um, China Mobile would be the leading operator if you were to, you know, push 5G hard in China. Um, the thing is, is that they have, you know, tons of revenue. They do, you know, tons of, they have tons of customers. They're, you know, they're one of the leading infrastructure build out partners uh, for Huawei. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they have, you know, a lot of, ties to the Chinese government as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of difficult to really know how truthful those numbers are, mm -hmm. but you also have to consider they have almost a billion users. Right. So 55 million isn't actually that outrageous in, in terms of percentage, of yeah. right? In terms of percentage, it's like five and a half percent. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possible just because of the scale that they have, but even then, I'm not entirely sure, you know, how many people in China are really going out and buying 5G devices this early in the year. Yeah. Um, just because the first three, you know, January, February, March, were pretty much locked down for China. So it's That's almost right. like saying that, you know, they got 55 million in a quarter, which is why I'm a little bit hesitant with those numbers. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I'm going to give them the benefit of doubt and say it's possible. Yeah. I If they said... We'll have a hundred million by the end of the year. I could see that happening. Sure. Um, but saying they have fifty-five million already is a bit difficult for me to believe. But that said, you know, I'm not. I'm going to be the first one to welcome, you know, five G momentum and yeah. growth and subs subscribers, right? Um, but this kind of backs up the two hundred million number we talked about last week, mm -hmm. because if they're already at fifty-five. And let's say they they were in June, so they probably will double it, if not more, mm -hmm. considering you know the pace of growth. So they'll probably hit let's say 125, 150. That's already the majority of the 5G subscriber base that's expected by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it'll be pretty easy to hit 230 million global 5G subscribers by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. And you know, and again, I, I talk about this quite often. The proof for me is in um, the actual applications that are going to be available. And I've talked about SK Telecom in South Korea, right. how they've been a real innovator leaning in the use case. And so, you know, for me, access is access. So it's, it's faster, better, right? And maybe it's just that, you know, these customers, 
if they had 5G enabled devices prior to the pandemic, which I, I would find kind of you know hard to believe, right? Uh, maybe it was just a flip of the switch, and now they've they've added 5G service to their plans. But well, um, I I think that one thing to think about is um, it's still EMBB, right? It's not really you know the broad scale multi application kind of 5G that mm -hmm. we're we're expecting to see in the future. Sure. Today it's pretty much just phones and hotspots. Yeah. Um, I guess if you have the new Lenovo, it could be a laptop too, um, which we talked about last week as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think I think it's just you know it's hard to develop new use cases when you're using the same types of devices. Sure. Um, and I don't even think they're using SA yet. So I think really when you get SA, that's when I think you will really start to see some more unique use cases. I think most use cases early on are, are gonna be mobile device, smartphone based, but mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be about how we augment video and how yeah. video is gonna change because uploads improve and downloads improve. And you can have much better real-time communications. I agree, I agree. Just a final thought from my perspective on that, you touched on devices and form factors and there was a, a big to-do with uh, the clamshell, the folding form factors, right? Um, that we've seen, you know, at, you know, at prior events, you know, um, Samsung has the Fold, Huawei, I believe it's the Mate X. And I think those form factors will unlock new use cases for like field service. And you mentioned video, and I agree with you, with 5G's very low latency, the ability to have access to, um, you know, 4K, 8K, 12K, high definition video streamed in real time, and using AR and VR, I think that's going to be really transformative. And you're absolutely right from my perspective. It's going to be those form factors that I think that are going to totally. Happen. And I actually agree with you. I think that's a huge, huge point because with the fold, I consume so much video and so much content on it more than I ever have on any other device. I even watched the um, MLS Cup final on the train home from LA, <laughs> and there were some connectivity issues, very yeah. minor, a yeah. few blips in and out. I think it was because I was switching between markets. But it would have been great to have it in like, you know, full 1080p, you know, HDR quality it would have been amazing, but yeah. it was still good. At, and, you know, I, that's where 5G kind of elevates the experience where it's no longer a unique thing, but it's daily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, let's move on. Yeah, let's move on. So my third topic this week, um, I spent a lot of time at the Linux Foundation. You know, I'm a firm believer in open source and what it can do to drive agility, um, you know, relative to, you know, traditional, you know, kind of methods of, uh, of software and technology delivery. And so I spent time with uh, Arpit Joshua Pura. He's actually the, the general manager of the Linux Foundation Networking Group. And uh, the Frankfurt ONAP release uh, came out June 18th. So we, uh, well, I was a few, few days late catching up with him on that, but this represents the sixth release. If you're not familiar with ONAP, it's, it's the open networking automation platform. And it promises to bring just that, automation to service providers and really supercharge 5G. And what, what Frankfurt does is it, it really brings um, a set of, uh, of hardened blueprints and, and, and tested solutions to bear. And what's really amazing, we talked about um, the number of uh, organizations that are a part of uh, this, this Linux Foundation working group. And when you look at the top 10, you know, I would expect them to be the traditional infrastructure providers, right? Like the Ericsson's of the world and the Huawei's of the world. And they're certainly very participant and they contribute quite a bit. But mm -hmm. in the top 10, the majority are operators. And yes. yeah, and AT&T is the largest contributor. And that's partly mm -hmm. because part of a project that they were working on was migrated into the ONAP project. But, Got it. Um, but I think, you know, this is great. I mean, automation is going to be necessary to facilitate things like network slicing and self healing. Uh -huh. And, uh, and again, I think open source is very disruptive and I've written about that on Forbes, you know, quite often. Any, any thoughts on, um, on ONAP? Have, have you had a chance to, to take a look at that? And I have not looked at the release, um, yeah. but now that we've talked about it, I will. Um, yeah. But in general, I think it's, um, I think it's important, right? Cause the, the truth is automation is super, super important for mm -hmm. stuff like network slicing. And that's basically a network function, right? It's, right. it's re it's reconfiguring the network to be optimized for a certain use case. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that, you know, manually and you can't do it um, without having really tight 
automation on your networking side. So mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, it's an inevitability. It's a question of, you know, what gets built into the standard and how quickly um, and who gets, who adopts it. But I think, you know, the, the point that operators are really about it is a big thing mm -hmm. because ultimately the operators are the ones who drive a lot of what gets adopted because if they yeah. don't adopt it, then it doesn't get, doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you know, and network slicing, that's gonna open up, you know, tremendous monetization opportunities for, for the operators. You know, the, the kind of the low hanging fruit in my, from my perspective is uh, guaranteeing a network slice to uh, deliver a, a degree of latency for, for mobile gaming responsiveness, right? right. Uh, and there are a whole host, obviously, of enterprise, you know, applications there as well. So, you know, the, the reason why the operators are behind it is because they see the true monetization benefit. But let's shift to your third and, and final topic this week. And um, I, know you, I know you follow, you know, Washington and, and news that goes on there. And you had some, some information to share based on a Wall Street Journal article you read. Yeah, so the Wall Street Journal, I believe it was, the article came out on the 25th. So mm -hmm. yeah, June 25th. Late breaking. It, and basically what it is, is it's kind of an update on what's been going on with the, the administration and them kind of pushing um, harder on securing our 5G networks by basically ensuring that the companies that are producing the hardware are based out of the U.S. Mm -hmm. or American companies or, or friendly those European allies. Companies. Right. Yeah, but yeah. but this, this actually sounded more like they weren't even entirely convinced that you know european companies were good enough um okay, in that interesting. Uh, this update sounded like they wanted to have um large u.s tech companies acquire these european entities to oh. um secure their leadership and you know u.s friendliness um yeah. and pretty much everybody pushed back on it um right. they've been working they've been pushing companies like dell Intel and Microsoft to possibly, um, you know, meet up and talk about this, but mm -hmm. because of COVID-19, they haven't been able to meet and talk yeah. it over. Um, they've also suggested that, you know, maybe uh, the vendors should open up their infrastructure or adopt open standards, which obviously is not in their best interest. Right. Um, and they kind of pushed back on that. Um, but I thought there was a really interesting quote um, from one of the, uh, I think it was Ericsson uh, executives um, where he said that um, they don't expect to join this policy coalition yeah. and that the, that they, that the governments shouldn't interfere with technical work that the private sector is well equipped to handle, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was very interesting because, um, you know, it's Sweden and they're definitely a little bit more socialist than the U S is mm -hmm. um, when it comes to social programs and stuff like that and government involvement. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, honestly, I'll be the first one to admit, I think it's kind of weird that the attorney general is getting involved in this any, to begin with. Yeah, right. um, and Larry Kudlow as well. Um, I, I feel like we should have a CTO of the US. I think we used to have one and that should be the person yeah. who should be handling this. Um, I just don't understand why the attorney general is involved at all. Um, and yeah. he's not just lightly involved, right? Like he's quoted repeatedly in this whole situation. So it's very odd to me. Um, I, I think long term, what should really happen is, you know, if we truly want to have a secure network in the US and not have Huawei equipment or any, you know, Chinese vendor, we should be funding the growth of the competition. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that if that means investing in these companies, because I think that was discussed as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it should be something along the lines of subsidizing operator purchases of this equipment because um, I, I just, I, I don't see how any, anything else really makes any sense. Right. Um, and we know that, you know, unofficially that, you know, the Chinese government is subsidizing Huawei in one way or another. So through credit facilities um, to customers exactly. or, or whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the way the reality is, is that um, why not meet a subsidy with a subsidy? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously that's expensive, but, you know, so making investments or making acquisitions, um, you know, isn't great either. And, you know, the reality is right now, nobody's particularly interested in funding acquisitions, right? The T-Mobile mm -hmm. merger closed this year only because it was like a year delayed. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think I think in this current situation, almost nobody is interested in facilitating the current administration's view of how things should be done. Um, and it's not going to be cheap. That's yeah. the reality. Um, yeah. It's going to cost a lot of money to one way or another. And, um, you know, Ericsson already moved their manufacturing to the U.S. to a certain yeah. degree. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's only, I think in general, you know, lots of manufacturers are going to come back to the U.S. if they want to be able to sell here, especially mm-hmm. if it has to do with, you know, critical infrastructure. But yeah. in general, I, I'm, I'm struggling um, just because almost every executive that the Wall Street Journal quoted pretty much was just not about it. Right. And I don't know how, how the government, well, this administration specifically, even knows where they're going with this if no one's interested in, you know, fighting. Yeah, I mean, and it's it, clearly the concern is around, you know, having, um, you know, a, a domestic supply chain to support an end-to-end deployment of 5G so that the U.S. is not dependent on, on any foreign country, whether it's, you know, a European country or it's a, a country in Asia or China. And, um, and this has been discussed on Wall Street for quite a while, uh, as well as, you know, on Capitol Hill. And, you know, how do you do this? And, you know, it's not realistic, you know, to divest these companies. I mean, they're, they're, they're for-profit companies, uh, but maybe the U.S. Should, um, should be, you know, talking to like Qualcomm that has great capabilities. They provide a lot of the, um, you know, the, the modem components for, for the smartphones that, you know, that we use and they're, they're leading 5G and it wouldn't be necessarily a stretch for, for Qualcomm to get in, you know, to, uh, to the infrastructure space. So it's, maybe it's providing subsidies to a company like Qualcomm and there are other companies in the U.S. Um, to, you know, to kind of move that forward. But time will tell, it's an interesting topic, but that, that wraps it up for this week. Why don't you take us home? Sure. Uh, we hope that our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. Uh, if anyone out there would like to provide us uh, some insight on a specific 5G topic that they would like us to cover in a future podcast, uh, please reach out to us on social media, on Twitter. Uh, Will is at Will Town Tech, and I am at Anshul Sog. We hope that you have a great weekend, and please tune again next time.